pseudonym about Bruce Lee. Lee Jun Fan born November 27, 1940, known professionally as Bruce Lee, was a Hong Kong American actor, director, martial artist, martial arts instructor, and philosopher. He was the founder of Jeet Kune Do, a hybrid martial arts philosophy drawing from the different combat disciplines that is often credited with paving the way for modern mixed martial art. Lee is considered by commentators, critics, media, and other martial artists to be the most influential martial artist of all time and a pop culture icon of the 20th century who bridged the gap between East and West. He is credited with helping to change the way Asians were presented in American films. Enough with the intro. Now let's get back to our discussion topic. Number 1. Bruce Lee came back in America because there was a hit out of his life. Lee destroyed an opponent with ties to organize crime in a bow. There was a problem so his parents sent him back to the United States. He also only had $100 in his pocket. That's actually $800 in today's dollars. But still it's not that much. Bruce ended up moving in with family friends in Seattle, Washington. He enrolled in a vocational school so he could earn a high school diploma which would make him eligible to attend the University of Washington. Number 2. He made so many famous martial arts students. During Bruce Lee's lift time he came in contact and made friends with many people that spanned from the average guy who may have been a student to popular actors of the time. Bruce's first ever student is Jesse Glover in Seattle. He trained with the Lee for about 5 years, sometimes more than once a day, and is considered an authority to Lee's style of training. When he began teaching his Jeet Kune Do style of martial arts, Lee only certified 4 people personally as instructors. His 4 people are James Yim Lee, Ted Young, Dan Innocento, and Taki Kimura. Dan Innocento has trained most of the Jeet Kune Do instructors after Bruce Lee's death. Innocento certified instructors for over 30 years which gave all of them direct lineage contact with Lee through him. Innocento and Staki Kimura were allowed to teach only a small group of students after Lee's death. Other students of Bruce Lee were Chuck Norris, Joe Lewis, Mike Stone who all were already martial artists. We all know about Chuck Norris being Lee's opponent in the movie Return of the Dragon in the famous Coliseum fight. Norris was already an accomplished martial artist when he met Lee. Having learned Tang Su Do in Korea while in the Air Force and competing and teaching back in the USA. The actor James Coburn could be found hanging out with Lee and was one of his students. Karim Abdul Jabbar, a basketball star in the ABA and the NBA, was a student and was in Bruce Lee's Game of Death as the last of the characters that Lee fought while going up to the pagoda. Steve McQueen brought his son to Bruce for martial arts instruction. Chuck Norris had also instructed his son. Number 3. Bruce Lee and Steve McQueen are good friends. Steve McQueen aka the king of cool who died seven years after Lee was one of the industry's most popular leading men especially in the action films. Lee and McQueen had much in common and were thick as thieves. One of the stories you may have heard is that Lee and McQueen were both good acquaintances of J. S. Bing, the celebrity hair stylist who was tragically murdered along with Tate by Charles Manson's followers. When Lee first relocated to California, C. Bing was one of his private kung fu clients and connected him with McQueen. McQueen soon became one of Lee's students. Slowly they became friends, known for toughness on and off screen. McQueen dealt with an abusive stepfather as a teen, who was part of a street gang. He learned how to fight at a young age and found himself in physical altercations when he was in the military too. According to Matthew Polly's Bruce Lee, a life, Lee was somewhat of a gang leader in school. Polly wrote Lee offered protection to those willing to follow him, but the ones who did admired him and Lee had a reputation for challenging other tough kids to fights. With that in mind, Lee and McQueen had similar natures and a lot in common. Lee said about McQueen, it took quite a while before I got to know him. But once he accepted me as a friend, we became real. Oh, once he caught up in street fights. Yes, it's true. Once he caught up in street fights, Bruce Lee took up the martial arts as a teenager to defend himself from bullies and street fighters who picked on his slight frame. After mastering many fighting techniques, he joined a street gang himself. Although urban legend says he fled Hong Kong as a result of the beating he administered to a triad connected teenager. More than likely, Lee's parents sent him back to the U.S. to improve his study habits. Lee was a poor and uninterested student, hoping a change of venue to keep him out of trouble. Number 5. Bruce Lee learned martial arts from YIP men. At 16, Lee began training under YIP men, one of the most legendary kung fu grandmasters of all time. IP man, also known as YIP man, was a Hong Kong martial artist and a master of martial art, Wing Chun. He had several students who later became martial 
martial arts masters in their own right. The most famous among them was Bruce Lee. Number six, other martial arts students does not like him because he was not pure Chinese. Early in his instruction, other kids could not train with him when they learned he was not 100% descendant from Chinese ancestry. Bruce's grandfather was a British. Many believed he was German. He still received personal training from YIP men and another acclaimed masters since they could tell he was worth the investment. Number seven, he was a phenomenal dancer. Lee accumulated trophies in more than just martial arts. In 1958, he won Hong Kong Shasha Dance Contest due to his expert ballroom dancing skills. Yes, you heard that correctly. Mr. Fists of Fury also possessed some fancy footwork in his repertoire. Back in the day, Lee traded training lessons in exchange for dance lessons. And they say one of his first jobs in America was a ballroom instructor. To this day, if you visit the Hong Kong Heritage Museum, you will find among Lee's featured possessions a notebook containing over 100 shasha steps. It's too bad they did not have shows like Dancing with the Stars back in those days. One can only imagine how Bruce Lee would have feared going up against the likes of John Travolta and other stars from that era. Knowing Bruce, he probably would have won that too. Number 8. He also had an unstoppable punch. He told USA Karate Champion Vic Moore it was coming and Moore failed to block it 8 times. Bruce stopped before he made impact however, otherwise he would not have landed all 8 attempts. Number 9. He decided to start his own style of martial arts after not beating an opponent quickly enough. The gauntlet had been laid down by a fellow teacher in San Francisco because Lee broke tradition and taught non-Chinese students. Obviously Bruce won the fight in 3 minutes but he thought it would should have been even easier if his kung fu was not so restrictive. His hands got swollen due to the punches and Lee saw this as a weakness in his method. Number 10. His style Jeet Kune Do was made to be more practical for street fighting. It stressed style of no style and shared the rigid structures of traditional kung fu. Bruce Lee and Dan Innocento coined the term and started the fighting philosophy Jeet Kune Do. Number 11. Bruce Lee voiced most of the English voices in his films. All the English speaking guys in Way of the Dragon apart from the mighty Chuck Norris and his other Hong Kong films released before Enter the Dragon were voiced by the main man himself. I am not sure why but a fact is a fact. Number 12. A Bruce Lee shot was removed from Big Boss. Bruce had a shot removed from the Big Boss where he cut into an opponent's head with a handheld saw. This is pretty common knowledge. But if you didn't know this, all you have to do is go back and watch the Big Boss fight in the ice factory and you will see him attack the camera with a saw and a skip past the resulting blow. This was removed because it was seen as being a little too violent for Hong Kong audiences. Number 13. He was a terrible driver. Many of the Bruce's American friends have said in the interviews in the past that Bruce Lee was not a gifted driver and would occasionally ask his buddy Steve Golden to drive for him. This may have been due to the next fact. Number 14. Bruce had bad eyesight. Bruce was nearsighted. His bad eyesight is one of the reasons he appreciated Wing Chun's contact style of movement because he could rely more on touch than sight. Number 15. Bruce Lee was one of the first people to try contact lenses. Due to his bad eyesight, Bruce Lee was one of the first people to try contact lenses. They were very uncomfortable back in those days. However, Bruce stuck to his coke bottle glasses instead, which leads into another fact. Number 16. He was a very humble person. Bruce Lee often wore his old taped up coke bottle glasses to remind himself of where he came from. Being the guy who likes to stay grounded and become the best version of himself, he held on to his old glasses and wore them regularly as a reminder of himself even after he found financial abundance that he was once poor and struggling. We will see him wearing those glasses in Fists of Fury. Number 17. His family called him Little Phoenix. They did not call him Bruce. Bruce was an English sounding name given to him by a nurse when he was born in San Francisco. It was not until he moved to America that it became used very regularly. You can notice this in the film The Young Bruce Lee. Bruce's sister Agnes was the one who first started calling him Little Dragon, a nickname that stuck with him in Asia throughout his life. Number 18. Bruce was secretly filmed and included in his best friend's feature film. In a film called Fists of Unicorn, Bruce Lee promised his friend Unicorn that he would help him with choreography. But the producers secretly filmed Bruce and included him in the film so they could promote his name and sell more tickets. Number 19. Bruce Lee hoped to one day fight with Muhammad Ali. Bruce thought of Muhammad Ali as a superior fighter with his speed and technicality. He used to watch footage of Ali constantly to learn his style and adapt some of his footwork and movements for that inevitable fight that would unfortunately never happen. Number 
20. He used to lie to get private Wing Chun lessons. Bruce used to ask for one-on-one -on -one sessions to advance his Wing Chun, but he was refused. So to get that one-on-one -on -one attention he wanted, he would wait outside the class, tell people that the class was off, and walk them to the bus stop. He would then return and be the only students available and get his private lessons. He got in major trouble when his instructor found out though. Number 21. Bruce Lee practiced 5,000 punches a day. He was dedicated. He did 5,000 punches a day to master his art. This explains why he was so powerful with his fists and had knockout jabs. Number 22. Bruce Lee used to train to the Mission Impossible theme music. In martial arts, training to music helps to develop a less predictable rhythm when fighting. So Bruce used to shadow box and train to the Mission Impossible theme music. But as we all know, Tom Cruise's Mission Impossible 1 was released in 22nd of May 1996 and Bruce Lee died 20th of July 1973. So it can't be the movie of Tom Cruise. So it's basically the TV series of Mission Impossible. Although music basically the same. Number 23. He used to puncture cans with his fingers. Back in the days when cans were not soft aluminium, Bruce used to bust them open with finger strike. He cut himself performing this on the set of the Big Boss though. So keep an eye out for the band-aids on his fingers during the movie. By the way, do you know one of his friends can break concrete by his hand? Yes, I mean the legendary Jackie Chan. Please kindly check my video dedicating Jackie Chan. Bruce Lee was crazily fast. Bruce used to demonstrate his speed by placing a coin in someone's hand. He would then snatch the coin and replace it with another before the person could clench their fist and stop him. Number 25. Bruce beat up Jackie Chan in Enter the Dragon. In one scene, he grabs Jackie by the hair and snaps his neck. Jackie also did stunts in some of Bruce's other movies including a fall for the villain in the fist of Fury's final fight. Number 26. Bruce was the inspiration behind a lot of big video game characters. Bruce Lee has been featured in many of his own standalone games which also inspiring many characters in gaming over the years. To honor the man who changed the world with his Jit Kune Do, a culture legacy so rich it's hard to even know where to begin in looking back at it. We have compiled this list of Bruce Lee video games while also including characters who are simply Bruce Lee but with a different name form. Characters like Fei Long who employs Lee's Jit Kune Do fighting style and wears his familiar black kung fu trousers and sleep on canvas shoes. Or characters like Martial Law in the Tekken series that really exemplifies the profound influence Lee has had on fighting video game designers. Let's see the top 10 game characters which resembles Bruce Lee. Number 1. Hitmon Lee. We are starting off this list with the only non-human entry on the list. Hitmon Chan and Hitmon Lee are the first generation Pokemon based on the legendary fighters Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee. He may not look like Bruce Lee but this Pokemon is also known as the Kicking Fiend. He is known for his ferocious kicks with jump kicks and strong kicks just like the legendary Bruce Lee. It may be the weirdest entry on this list but Hitmon Lee looks like a complete badass. Number 2. Jackie Bryant. Here is another character who does not really resemble Bruce Lee. Jackie has bright blonde hair, a fondness of red lightning and leather jackets. The only thing they have in common is their fighting style. Jackie is a user of Bruce Lee's signature Jet Kevin Do. In the Virtua Fighter series, Jackie Bryant can actually utilize some of the signature moves that Bruce Lee mastered in his real life. Jackie is really strong because of his speed and his ability to combo. Number 3. Han Fu. Han Fu from the Fatal Fury series is a composite character inspired by both Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee combined. Han Fu is a clumsy Hong Kong police officer who is friendly to everyone. He is very proficient fighter known for his acrobatic. Han Fu is reminiscent of Bruce Lee for one major reason and that is his nunchucks. Bruce Lee is commonly known for his impressive nunchuck styles and Han Fu is no exception. Han Fu is so skilled he can wield two at a time and light them on fire without harming himself. Number 4. Nunchuck. Speaking of nunchucks, we have an obscure reference from the father of fighting game. E R Kung Fu. E R Kung Fu is a fighting game created in 1985 and is supposed to have inspired all fighting games that ca came after it. In this game, technically two characters are inspired by Bruce Lee. First of the main character, Oolong, has a fighting style similar to Lee. However, the character that makes this list is Nancha. Nancha is another character that fights with nunchucks, but he also pays homage to Lee by wearing the yellow track so Lee made famous for his film Game of Death. Number 5. Dragon Chan. Since Bruce Lee is known for his kicks, we would not expect to find an homage to Bruce Bruce Lee in a punch out game. But here is Dragon Chan in the SNES and arcade versions of Super Punch Out. Like many characters in this
this list, Dragon Chan is based off Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan combined. His name is an obvious reference to both characters. His appearance, though, is actually modeled off Lee as he is chi a Chinese boxer from Hong Kong. Dragon Chan is a formidable foe. His swinging kick attack must be ducked or it can knock you out in just one hit. Number 6. Jan Lee Besides the obvious homage to Bruce Lee in this dead or alive character's name, there are several other things that can connect Jan Lee to Bruce Lee. Jan Lee learned Jeet Kune Do by watching Bruce Lee films. He studies these films over and over until he was able to master the style. He also based many of his outfits on Bruce Lee, like the yellow tracksuit we saw before or martial arts uniform with a dragon emblem. The dragon was commonly connected to Bruce Lee. He even has the same birthday as Bruce Lee. However many connections there are, there are so many differences too. Jan Lee is a cocky fighter who often claims victory even after the fight begins. He is aggressive and always looking for fight, unlike the real Bruce Lee's humble laid-back attitude. Number 7. Kim Dragon Kim Dragon was the inspiration for this list. His name is an obvious reference to Bruce Lee, but there is so much more you need to know about this fighter from the World Heroes or series of fighting games. He has the fighting style of Bruce Lee with the high-pitched screams, the flying kicks, and the really intense speed. He has the occupation of Bruce Lee with being a martial arts movie star and martial artist. He also is a kung fu master. One of the big differences is that Kim Dragon is a Korean while Bruce Lee is not. Number 8. Lee Kang Lee Kang's resemblance to Bruce Lee was almost entirely coincidental. He was originally supposed to represent a bold monk character, or should I say character, since this is Mortal Kombat after all. However, the actor for the digitized graphics refused to shave his head, so they changed his design to resemble Bruce Lee. One thing that Bruce Lee did a lot of was high-pitched screaming as he performed his attacks. You will hear that from a lot of these characters on this, but especially the final four. Lee Kang as he is flying through the air will scream like there is no tomorrow. In addition to appearance and screams, Lee Kang's fighting style is an homage to Lee. Lee Kang flies through the air with devastating kicks and he can shoot fireballs. Remember when I said Bruce Lee was associated with dragon? Well, Lee Kang can actually turn into a Fei Long. Fei Long which literally means flying dragon is a character introduced is one of the 50 iterations of Street Fighter 2. Let's just look at the similarities between the two. We have already covered the name but there are plenty more similarities. Fei Long is a martial artist who was a Hong Kong movie star just like Bruce Lee. Fei Long quit films and came up with his own style of martial arts just like Bruce Lee. Fei Long focuses on quick strikes and flying kick just like Bruce Lee. Fei Long's costume is similar to one just like Bruce Lee wore. Fei Long makes high pitched scream when he attacks just like Bruce Lee. Fei Long's victory quote is there can never be another legend like the great one and his son which is reference to Bruce Lee and his son Brandon. Number 10. Martial Law. Martial Law from the Tekken series is Bruce Lee. Like all other characters in the list he has many similarities with the martial arts legend. He practices Jit Kyundu, has flying kicks, fast punches, loud screams. He wears the yellow jumpsuit. He is mistaken for Fei Long who we already have covered is a Bruce Lee inspired character. He has several different outfits and throws that are inspired by Bruce Lee movies. He has all of this but there is one thing that sets martial law above the rest and that is his son Forest Law. Forest Law is an obvious homage to Bruce Lee's son Brandon. The, the two fight together and are inspired by the father-son duo of Bruce and Brandon Lee. Number 27. Bruce proved his strength many times in competition, becoming the Hong Kong high school boxing champion, defeating all of the opponents including British boxer Gary Elms. Bruce also knocked out a Shoi Lee fat fighter named Chang in a Seattle full contact match in 1958, refereed by Xiang Liang. Young and another the same year named Ye Chi is a match refereed by Jesse Glover. This is additional to the famous Young Jack Man fight in 1965 and numerous challenge matches he had both before and during his famous yeah. Bruce Lee wrote a film called The Silent Flute. Bruce Lee wrote a film named The Silent Flute which was never made in his lifetime. It was later adapted and shot with David Carradine in 1978 and called The Circle of Iron. Number 29. McQueen, Coburn and Norris were all Paul Bearers at Bruce Lee's funeral. Bruce Lee died in 20th July 1973. So many friends and fans came in his funeral. Among the friends, McQueen, Coburn and Norris are notable. It proves they have a great friendship. Number 30. Bruce Lee used to take cannabis. Bruce Lee used to take Nepal hashish, which is an extremely strong form of cannabis. This is a cause of some controversy over his death, many pointing the finger at the cannabis use. Bruce was a self-admitted cannabis user and chewed the staff for more than 10 years but changed supplies
expires recently before he died. Number 31. He had epilepsy. Bruce was also reported as having epilepsy when he was a small child. Number 32. He had his sweat glands removed from his armpit. Tired of sweaty pits and the ugly look they bring about, Bruce Lee had his sweat glands surgically removed in 1972 for aesthetic reasons. Number 33. He was a child star. Bruce was introduced to the film industry by his father who was a famous Cantonese opera star. He appeared in many films as a child. His very first film was a Cantonese US production called Golden Gate Guard, shot while he was in San Francisco. When he was only three months old, he played a baby girl. When he was still a child, he told his mother that he would be a famous movie star. By the age of six, he was in a Hong Kong film called The Birth of Mankind, where he was a street kid getting into fights. He ended up making 20 films by the time he was 18 years old. By the time he was an adult, he was very comfortable behind the phone. Bruce failed a basic military physical test. Bruce failed a basic military physical in 1963, held by the US Army Draft Board. This was due to his poor eyesight. He managed to evade being shipped off to Vietnam because of that. Number 35. He had an all-night training session with Chuck Norris outside his hotel room. One day in New York, Bruce Lee and Chuck Norris stayed in the same hotel. As they went up in the elevator, they started sparing and kept doing so in the hallway of their room until 4 a.m. Number 36. Bruce gave Chuck Norris his first job in movies. We are not talking about Way of the Dragon though. It was earlier. Bruce was a stunt coordinator in a film called Wrecking Crew, starring Dean Martin. Bruce got Chuck one quick scene, which started with one line of dialogue, followed by a fight scene. Hot Chuck I not so tough in this scene. He throws a bad kick and gets knocked out. Number 37. His imitators called Bruce's politician. Bruce was so popular that he had a long list of imitators in the film over the year, creating a subgenre called Bruce's politician. There are hundreds if not thousands of these Bruce's politician films out there, as filmmakers everywhere tried to recreate Lee's presence, failing at every turn. Number 38. Bruce Lee was quite a good sketch artist. The world knows Bruce Lee, the martial artist and movie actor, who however have seen his drawings and his artistic talent. In the early 90th century, Linda Lee compiled an exhibition of some of his sketches. It is my understanding that the original sketches were purchased by a Japanese collector and have not been in the public since then. For those of you who are interested, you can see some of his martial arts sketches in the Bruce Lee's book, The Tao of G9. He was a poet. Bruce Lee wrote a lot of poetry, including a lot in his book, The Tao of Jit Kindu. According to his friends, he loved the art of poetry and wrote it regularly. The world artist definitely sums the man up. Number 40. He was one of the influential people. Bruce Lee was named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people of the 20th century. Well, he was pretty damn influential. We are talking about him now and it's been over 40 years since he died. Number 41. Bruce Lee used to carry 0.357 Magnum. When, when people everywhere want to fight with you to prove themselves, you fear for your safety. Anyone with a half brain would be cautious. So Bruce carried a gun of 0.357 Magnum. J.C. Glover confirms that he was a crack shot. Number 42. His nickname was Little Dragon. Bruce was born on the Chinese year of the dragon, on the day of the dragon, on the hour of the dragon. It's fitting that he was commonly nicknamed Little Dragon. Number 43. His nickname was Little Peacock. While the world called him Bruce, his family called him Little Peacock. Due to a superstition that believed by naming a boy with a girl's name would mean evil spirits would not follow them. Number 44. He used to charge $275 an hour for private martial arts lessons. Bruce Lee used to charge and get $275 an hour for private martial arts lesson in the 60th century, which is equivalent of $1,800 per hour by today's okay. kind. Bruce led a gang as a teenager known as the Tigers of Junction Street. As a matter of fact, he was very keen to start martial arts at the time after he, the thought occurred to him. What would he do if his gang was not around to protect him? Number 46. Way of the Dragon was remade for the US. The famous movie Way of the Dragon was originally made for the Chinese audiences in Chinese language. But after the popularity of the film, they remade it in English language. Number 47. His father was his first martial arts instructor. Bruce quotes his father as his first ma martial arts instructor, teaching him a bit of Tai Chi when he was growing up. Number 48. He was a book lover. Bruce had an extensive library of over 2000 books. Bruce read constantly, going through books cover to cover, highlighting sections, and always searching for knowledge. He was even known to watch TV, read a book, and call a dumbbell all at the same time. Number 49. Bruce knows judo and grappling. Bruce learned judo and grappling from judo legend Gene Lebel. Bruce worked with Gene 
on the green hornet and the two shared some antics, including Jing picking up Bruce and throwing him over the, his shoulder. Rocking him out, okay. Bruce Lee's The Green Hornet was known as the Kato Show in Hong Kong. The Green Hornet is an American action television series that aired on ABC in the 1966 to 1967 television season, starring Van William as The Green Hornet or Brit Reid and Bruce Lee as Katiba Bachelor and media mogul. Brit Reid is the owner and publisher of the Daily Sentinel newspaper. But as the Mark's vigilant Green Hornet, he fights crime with the assistance of his martial arts expert partner Kato and his weapons and enhanced car, a custom imperial called the Black Beauty. On police records, the Green Hornet is a wanted criminal, but in reality the Green Hornet is a masquerading as a criminal so that he can infiltrate and battle criminal gangs, leaving them and the incriminating evidence for police arrival. Although the show got cancelled in the US, Bruce's Hong Kong brothers and sisters knew who the real star was. Not surprisingly, this helped him get the role in the Big Boss. The Green Hornet was the first time that Kung Fu had been seen in the West, besides in movie theaters in Chinatown district. It should also be noted that Bruce had to slow down his fighting movements because they became a blur while being filmed, and the show also used slow motion to play the fight scenes so they could capture the full effect of Bruce Lee's skills. Number 51. Bruce Lee could not swim. Bruce's brother, Robert, and sister Phoebe revealed that Bruce actually hated the water and could not swim. Number 52. There is still a lot of unseen footage from Bruce's movies still exist. In a world where footage of Bruce is worth big bucks, there is still some footage exist that has not been used for some kind of profit. There is apparently 20 minutes of unseen footage of the movie The Way of the Dragon, which has not been released yet. In a BBC interview with Bruce Lee on the set of Enter the Dragon, it has been confirmed by John Saxon, who was also in the interview. I wonder when the public will see this footage. Number 53. Bruce Lee's car was protected by the Green Hornet. Bruce drove around with a bumper sticker that said, the car is protected by the Green Hornet. He does not afraid of death. Bruce was once quoted as saying, if I should die tomorrow, I will have no regrets. I did what I wanted to do. You can't expect more from life. Well done, sir. Although tragic his death was at 32, you cannot deny the accomplishments of the man. Number 55. Lee's last movie scene was filmed after his death. Lee was shooting for the film Game of Death, but the makers had to rewrite the script after his shocking demise midway into the shooting schedule. The new script included actual footage from his funeral, where a close-up of his inbound days appeared in the film. Number 56. Story behind the name. Bruce Lee's full name is Lee Jun Fan. Jun means to arouse to the active state, and Fan refers to the Chinese name of the city of San Francisco, Lee's city of birth. His name Bruce was given to him by a nurse in the Jackson Street Hospital where he was born. Number 57. His major was philosophy. He was of a philosophical bent of mind and studied the subject at university as well. In fact, he applied the electric philosophy in his fighting technique. Number 58. Once his doctor said he can't perform Kung Fu anymore. In 1970, while working out one morning, injured one of his sacral nerve. His doctor said that he would never be perform Kung Fu again. Strong as still, he worked hard and regained fitness in one year's time. Number 59. Once an extra challenged Lee. Once during the shooting of film Enter the Dragon, an extra challenged Bruce Lee to a fight. The actor duly accepted the challenge and beat him in just three. Jackie Chan starred his debut in Bruce Lee films. Action star Jackie Chan began his career as an extra and was part of some of Lee's films. He played a guard who jumped into the frame and grabs Bruce from behind. Chan, an extra in Enter the Dragon, was badly hit by Bruce Lee with a bow, which is traditional wooden weapon used in Asia. Number 61. Unusual fitness regime. Bruce Lee is known worldwide for his odd defying fitness feats. One of them included performing 100 push-ups using the index finger and thumb. Number 62. Each grain down. It is said Lee used to practice throwing grains or rice up in the air and catch them with chopsticks as a training exercise. Number 63. He never went into swimming pool after a traumatic experience in his youth. When Bruce was young, he pushed his sister Phoebe into swimming pool as a joke and she responded by holding his head under the water until he promised never to do it again. But then on, he never went into a swimming pool again. Number 64. He won his first boxing tournament at the age of 17. When he was 17, he won a boxing tournament put on by 12 Hong Kong schools even though he had no formal training in boxing. Number 65. One reason for the change of Kung Fu to Kung Fu in America. Bruce met and became friends with a man named James Lee who was an author of several books on the fighting arts of the Orient Karate and Kung Fu. Bruce asked why he had chosen to spell it Kung Fu rather than traditional Cantonese Kung Fu. James replied that since most Americans didn't know Chinese pronunciation, he felt that his spelling would make it more
more accessible and marketable in that he got rejected by a girl he liked. He dated a girl named Amy Sambo for three years and asked her to marry him multiple times, even though she kept rejecting him. The last time was in the summer of 1963, before he was to return to Hong Kong to visit his family. He said no and they went on their separate way. Number 67. He had a great sense of humor. It is a story Doug Palmer shared about Bruce Lee. He used to act like a geek and let a street punk goad him. And when the punk swung, Bruce would block it awkwardly and snap at the punk's groin, incapacitating him with a blow that appeared to be an accident. As the punk rolled in the pain, Bruce would cover his mouth with his hand and titter effeminately, then walk off. A person can accept getting beaten by someone who is stronger or bigger than he is. Would, would, but if he thinks he has been beaten by a fairy, he will be pissed off for the rest of his life. Number 68. Bruce Lee became circumcised. Although circumcising basically for Muslim people, Bruce Lee became circumcised at the age of 22 while he was visiting Hong Kong because his father suddenly wanted Bruce to be circumcised. Number 69. Had a shotgun wedding to Linda Emery. Bruce returned to Seattle on August 12, 1964 and secretly married Linda who was pregnant using the wedding ring of James Lee's wife which she had left him. How his first screen test in Hollywood came about. Bruce did a Kung Fu demonstration in Long Beach at a karate tournament in 1964. A Beverly Hills saloon owner Jay Sebring was in the audience and was impressed with what he saw from Bruce. One of the saloon owner's clients who was a TV producer was getting a haircut and mentioned that he was looking for someone to play the part of Charlie Chan's son. Jay suggested Bruce Lee and the producer listened and Bruce Lee ended up getting a screen test for the role. Another incident we came to know that Starling Silifant, a famous screenwriter who was training under Bruce, helped Bruce get beat parts in television shows and helped him make his first acting gigs in a feature length film in America. A small role in the film Marlowe. Number 71. He had back pain. He started to have severe back pain in the months before him and his family were to move into Los Angeles and before the shooting of Green Hornet. The back pain would be an on and off again issue for the rest of his life. Number 72. He once faced financial problems. Although he was a well-known celebrity and had a successful film and martial art career, he had financial problems because of his spending. Though he was struggling to meet his mortgage payments on his new house, he decided to buy a new Porsche and went racing with Steve McQueen along Murohant Drive. Number 73. What led him to write his famous My Definite Chief Aim? In 1969, Bruce damaged a sacral nerve and was experiencing a severe muscle spasm. For weeks, he was sidelined on his bed as the bills piled up and stress mounted on him. It would lead him to write his famous My Definite Chief Aim. His Definite Chief Aim was I, Bruce Lee, will be the first high speed oriental superstar in the United States. In return, I will give the most exciting performance and render the best quality in the capacity of an actor. Starting 1970, I will achieve world fame and from then onwards, till the end of 1980, I will have in my possession $1 million. I will live the way I please and achieve inner harmony and happiness. After writing this, he started to train and teach again, even though he was still in severe form. He did not know he was becoming a star in Asia because of the Green Hornet. Bruce has secured a role in a new television pilot called Long History. And while he waited for it to start filming, he went to Hong Kong to arrange for his mother to come and live in the US. Upon arrival, he was greeted by multiple reporters and was requested to appear on talk shows because of his role of Kato. His newfound fame in Asia was a surprise to him. The newfound fame led him to search for future film ventures in Hong Kong. He signed a deal with Raymond Chow to make two feature films in Asia. He would return to Asia after filming his role in Long Street. Number 75. The Big Boss's budget was less than $100,000, which at the time would not have paid for a 60-second TV commercial in US. There was not much of a script for the film, as a common in Hong Kong film during the time period, and they improvised as they went along and shot very quickly. A random fact about the film is that the prostitutes in the film were actual prostitutes, besides one of them, who was an actress. The same thing would happen again in Bruce Lee's last film. The film was a huge success in Hong Kong. Within three weeks of its release, the big boss smashed all of his box records, earning over 3 million Hong Kong dollars. Number 76. Fists of Fury was the film that started the association of nunchakas with Bruce Lee. The film's success would also change Bruce Lee and the Hong Kong film industry. His second film in Hong Kong, Fists of Fury, was filmed in six weeks on a budget of $100,000. It would end up breaking the big boss's box office record in four weeks. The nunchakas had been used by Bruce Lee briefly in the Green Hornet, but it was his use of them in Fists of Fury that cemented the association of him with the weapons. He uses nunchakas to brutal effect. After the 
film, Bruce decided he wanted to create his own production company. So he formed Concord Productions with Raymond Chow. He decided he wanted to write and direct the films he was in. And he wanted to receive a split of the profits. He sent shockwaves to the Hong Kong film industry because everyone involved in the film process in the past, including actors, had been poorly paid except for the producer. The result of Bruce Lee demanding this caused other people in the film industry to demand better pay. It forever changed the way Hong Kong film industry okay. went. He was writer, producer, director and actor. Bruce Lee wrote, produced, directed and starred in Way of the Dragon. He also scouted the locations, cast it, used the wardrobe and choreographed the fight scene. Essentially, he did almost everything for the film. Some other random facts about the film was that it was the first Hong Kong film to be shot in Europe. Bruce played percussion of the music for the soundtrack. Bruce spent over 45 hours of the fight scenes with Chuck Norris and the film would break the box office record he ju had just set with Fist of Fury within 3 weeks. Number 78. He was voted most dressed actor of the year. Around the time The Way of the Dragon, the Hong Kong press voted Bruce Lee most dressed actor of the year because he often likes to wear silk suits and other elaborate outfits. Number 79. All the issues on the set of Enter the Dragon. The director of the film and Bruce had trouble pronouncing certain letters at times. So supposedly the director of the film asked a screenwriter to change the name of British agent in the script to fuck Bruce up. There was a shortage of translator on the set. So there was difficulty in communication between the American and Chinese crews. The Americans were not familiar with the way the Chinese film worked and vice versa which caused conflict. Bruce was extremely stressed with everything and went missing from the set. The film started shooting and went on shooting for at least two weeks without him. Actual fights happened on the set between stuntmen and extras hired from tired families. The prisoners on the film were actual derelicts from the streets of Hong Kong. The prostitutes on the set were also real prostitutes and earned more than most of the crew, causing ill will on the set. The actor Peter Archer almost wrong. Bruce had to get stitches on his finger because he had sliced open his finger during a take of the fight scene with Bob Wall because they used real glass bottles instead of fake ones. As you can probably imagine, it was an extremely stressful film to make and sadly was Bruce's last film. The studio changed the, studio changed the title to Blood and Steel, which Bruce disputed and then they changed it to Hans Island. He threatened to never work for them again if they did not change it back. They eventually set it back to enter the dragon. Bruce Lee ordered a gold rose royal furnish in anticipation of the success of Enter the Dragon. But he, but he would die before the release of the film and the arrival of the pro Chinese scene in Chinese connection got standing ovations from Chinese audiences. For Asians, Bruce's film hit a nerve. They tap into a raw mixture of aggressiveness and ethic pride. Reportedly, one particular scene in the Chinese connection inspired spontaneous applause from Chinese audiences. It's the scene when Bruce's character comes across that nasty sign outside Huang Ku Park, the one that reads no dogs and Chinese allowed. Rather than submit himself to humiliation at the hands of the Japanese, Bruce kicks their asses and then breaks the sign with a flying kick. This scene had its basis in real history. Chinese citizens were restricted from the Shanghai Park during the years of British and Japanese occupation. Number 81. Being entered the dragon, Bruce did not perform his signature acrobatic flips. Bruce severely injured his back in 1970. He was performing a weightlifting move called a good morning and he tweaked his sacral nerve. As a result, Bruce could not perform many of the aerial moves that he is famous for in Enter the Dragon such as the forward flip in the O'Hara fight scene. Instead, stunt master Yen Biao, who was also close friends with Jackie Chan and Samo Hang, performed this acrobatic move. Yen Biao would later acted as a double for Bruce in the posthumous Game of Death as well. Number 82. He did break an extra's arm by accident. It's an iconic moment in Enter the Dragon. After what might be the most lopsided fight in the history of Kung Fu. Bruce Lee with an incredible running sidekick knocks Karate Master Bob Wall flat on his ass. They ran several takes for this and Wall, a consummate professional, encouraged Bruce to make it look and feel as real as possible. On the 6th or 7th take, Bruce kicked Wall so hard that when he fell back, he broke an extra's arm. One can only imagine how Wall's torso felt for the next several days. Number 83. He was a writer. He published his first book, Chinese Kung Fu, The Philosophical Art of self defense a hybrid of martial arts, instruction, and philosophy. A second book, The Tao of Jit Kune Do, was compiled from his notes and published. First of all, Bruce had to slow down his moves so that film cameras could capture his movement. One of the Bruce's first Hollywood roles was as Kato in The Green Hornet, a role he came to dislike because he was playing a supporting character instead of the lead. When Bruce first started filming the fight scenes, he had to do several retakes.
this was simply too quick for the cameras. At first, it was very really well. All you could see were people falling down in front of me. Both sides. Even when I slowed down, all the camera showed was a blur. In film, Bruce was recorded at a higher frame rate to ensure that his moves could be followed by the human eye. Number 85. Had Bruce not died, Game of Death would have been a martial arts masterpiece. Bruce's last film, Game of Death, was released five years after his death. It was a disaster. The plot was a stock crime syndicate narrative and the real Bruce did not even appear most of the film. Instead, several lookalikes and stuntmen pulled acting duties and all footage from earlier Bruce films was interspersed out. In a particularly tacky moment, the filmmakers incorporated real footage of Bruce's funeral into the storyline. The only new material was at the very end when Bruce fought Dan Innocent and J.E.G. and Karim Abdul Jabbar in the Red Paper restaurant. Bruce's original conception of the film was much better. He envisioned a five-level pagoda where each level would be guarded by a different martial arts master. The original Game of Death would have been a philosophical endorsement of Bruce's lifestyle, Jit Kirindu style. Bruce would conquer each level of pagoda until only he was left standing. Unfortunately, Bruce was only able to film the top three levels of pagoda. The Innocento, J.I.G. and Abdul Jabbar fights before his death. Such a pity. What he would not give to see the original concept brought to life. Number 86. Bruce got cheated out of playing Kane in the TV show Kung Fu. We all know about Kung Fu, the cult 70th century TV series about Wai Chan Kane, a Kung Fu master who worked the art in the old American world. What a lot of people don't know, however, is that Bruce Lee was considered for the lead role. Unfortunately, even though Kane was an Asian character, the studios were not willing to take a risk on an Asian male lead. So the role of Kane went to a white man. David Karras in her memoirs, Bruce's widow Linda makes an even more inflammatory accusation that Bruce had been developing Kung Fu as the warrior and that it was stolen from him by Warner Bros. Creator Ed Spielman, however, vehemently disputes this, claiming that the similarities between the idea and Bruce's are a total seven. He trained both of his children in Jeet Kirindu. Not only Lee's children taught how to speak Cantonese, but he also instructed the two of them in Jeet Kirindu, the martial arts style he created. Both children started as toddlers in Jeet Kirindu and trained with him up until their father's death, becoming quite adept at the style. Number 88. Lee never believed his martial arts practice would lead to fame. In a 1971 interview with Pierre Wharton, Lee stated that he never thought that what he practiced every day would turn into this stardom. He trained in martial arts for its own merits for knowledge, defense, and the science, but he later learned how to incorporate it into acting. Lee was an advocate of fitness and the science of motion and wanted to express that in his films through martial arts. Number 89. His son Brandon also died under mysterious circumstances. In March of 1993, Brandon Lee, the son of Bruce and Linda Lee, was filming The Cop, a crime thriller whose plot called for him to be murdered by gunshot. Lee was to be shot with a blank range from a pistol. Ultimately, the pistol retained the lead tip of a previously used dummy cartridge. When discharged by a blank range, the lead projectile also hit Lee in the midsection, inflicting a freakish internal injury that managed to tear Lee's aorta. He collapsed and was subsequently rushed to the hospital, but massive internal bleeding ultimately cost him his life. The crow would eventually be released without the actual footage of Lee's shooting, contrary to urban legend. Brandon Lee was buried next to his father in Seattle, Washington. Although quite muscular, Bruce Lee was only 5 feet 7 inches. Although Lee sported a famously chiseled physique, he stood at only slight 5 feet 7 inches and weighed at most 140 pounds. At the time of his death, he weighed only 128 pounds. Lee's physique was the result of a strict diet which avoided most of the fats typical of Western food. Lee stuck to a regiment that cut out flour consisted of small meals consumed throughout the course of the day and got most of his nourishment from protein drink. Number 91. Lee suffered a serious back injury in 1970. On August 13, 1970, Bruce Lee was performing what is known as Good Morning, a weight lifting exercise consisting of placing a barbell on the shoulders behind the head and then performing a series of squats. Without a proper warm-up and in the midst of the routine, Lee heard a cracking noise from his back. He suffered nerve damage to his spine that required six months of rest and rehabilitation. More importantly, he would require stunt doubles and standings for the rest of his movie career. His back no longer allowing his former flexibility and precision. The painkillers he proceeded to take for his chronic back pain may also have contributed to his premature death. 
can lead to another medication and to do. Bruce Lee's body. When we think about Bruce Lee, we all remember him totally being real, which he was. Every time we saw him, especially during his movies, we could see his shriveled frame, his abs, and all that muscle, without an ounce of fat to be seen. He basically appeared to be as close to perfection as possible. But looks can be deceiving. First of all, Bruce Lee's left leg was an inch shorter than his right. Hard to tell considering how fast his kicks were. But Bruce actually had some work done to his body when he had the sweat glands removed from his armpits. They were surgically removed in 1972 for aesthetic reasons. Bruce hated having sweaty pits. Number 93. Bruce Lee was an atheist. Bruce grew up in a bi-religious setting. His mother was Catholic and would go to church on Sundays, while his father was Buddhist. Although Bruce was sent to Catholic school at one point during his upbringing, his parents never really forced their religion upon him. As an adult, Bruce claimed that he was an atheist. When he was asked to an interview about what religion he followed, he simply replied, none whatsoever. When he was asked if he believed in God, he said, to be perfectly frank, I really do not. Bruce believed in the individual's ability to find oneself through spirituality and self-discovery. He felt that man, the living creatures, the creating individual is always more important than any established style or system. To him, organized religion was a step in the wrong direction as it formed people's beliefs and ultimately divided them. Number 94. His family used to call him Mo Si Tang. Bruce Lee's real name was Lee Jun Fan, but his family called him Mo Si Tang, which means never sits still. Number 95. How Bruce Lee met his wife. Bruce and Linda met while he was leaving a Kung Fu demonstration in a high school Linda attended. She then became his student and the two fell in love. Marrying after his net out. According to celebrity net worth, Bruce Lee was worth approximately 10 million at the time of his death in 1973 and his estate still brings in millions of dollars annually. Number 97. The controversial scene from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. One of the best scenes from the movie came when Brad Pitt's character Cliff Booth fought Bruce Lee. Played wonderfully by Mike Moon. On the set of The Green Hornet, after Lee said that he would cripple Cassius Clay, the scene was highly controversial as the member of Lee's family were outraged of how he was portrayed in the film, saying he would never act like that way. He was known to be a very humble man and while the scene was certainly entertaining, it was inaccurate. Number 98. Bruce Lee says that Muhammad Ali would have killed him in a real fight. Many people have said throughout the years that Bruce Lee had a lot of respect for Muhammad Ali. One of those people was the director of Lee's most famous film, Enter the Dragon, Robert Klaus. In his 1987 book, The Making of Enter the Dragon, Klaus said that he was once screening an Ali documentary at Golden Harvest Studios in Hong Kong and revealed that what he would thought would happen if the two ever fought. Ali was world heavyweight champion at the time and Bruce saw him as the greatest fighter of them all. The documentary showed Ali in several of his fights. Bruce set up a wide full length mirror to reflect Ali's image from the screen. Bruce was looking into the mirror moving along with Ali. Bruce's right hand followed Ali's right hand. Ali's left foot followed Bruce's left foot. Bruce was fighting in Ali's shoes. Everybody says I must fight Ali someday. Bruce said. I am starring every move he makes. I am getting to know how he thinks and moves. Bruce knew he could never win a fight against Ali. Look at my hand. He said. That's the little Chinese hand. He would kill me. Number 99. His notable movies. He is noted for his films in five feature length martial arts film in early 1970s century. Low Ways The Big Boss 1971 and Feast of Fury 1972. Golden Harvest Sway of Dragon 1972. Directed and written by Lee. Golden Harvest and Warner Brothers Enter the Dragon 1973 and The Game of Death 1978. Both directed by Robert Bruce Lee cool. invented one inch punch. One of the most infamous fighting moves that are associated with Lee was the use of the one inch punch. There is one instance where a man was driven back 16 feet after being knocked back by it. The one inch punch is something that he picked during his training in Wing Chang that is originally a punching exercise. The punch is also used by several movies such as Kill Bill Volume 2. Number 101. Nokia create a fake ad of Bruce Lee. In this ad, the legend Lee stands in his familiar black piped jumper. The film is grainy black and white. At one end of a ping pong table, he is across from his opponent. He is just about to serve. What follows is visually amazing. The ball leaves the tabletop and out come Lee's nunchucks. The puck of the balls bounce into the air. Lee's weapon wheels and the ball rockets back. One arm behind his back, Lee moves delicately. Sometimes his leg is in the air, sweeping the space just over the table. Sometimes his whole body 
body is above aloft in right this goes on and on gloriously just for about 60 seconds and then it is over the crowd erupts and the scene suddenly pulls back to the face of nokia's n96 model phone it is now in its screen the phone revolves this phrase is engraved upon the back number one or two the statue of bruce lee the bruce lee statue in hong kong is a memorial figure of deceased martial artist bruce lee the hong kong memorial was built on behalf of bruce lee who died on 20th july 1973 at the age of 32 the hong kong bruce lee club raised hundred thousand dollars for a statue to be erected after please to the government to honor his legacy a 2.5 meter bronze statue by artist kao chong yen was erected among the avenue of stars attraction near the waterfront at sing sha sui it shows a classic ready to strike bruce lee pose as seen in 1972 movie fists of fury he kuan yao a member of bruce lee fan club committee said he wants the people to know about the legend of bruce lee the, the statue was unveiled by bruce lee's brother robert lee on 27 november 2005 celebrating what would have been bruce's 65th birthday the statue was featured on the 10th leg of american reality tv show the amazing day 17 and the 10th leg of american race nodes 1 and the third leg of the amazing race okay. and the free version of bruce lee statue you can also pay for tickets to go to madame to swords to see the works figure of bruce lee bursting through the window while doing a sidekick number one of three his remarkable death on july 20 1973 lee was in hong kong to have dinner with actor george lazenby with whom he intended to make a film lee met producer raymond Shaw at 2 p.m at home to discuss the making of the film game of death they worked until 4 p.m and then drove together to the home of lee's colleague betty ting pei a taiwanese actress who had an affair with her although he was married to linda emery for nine years and had two children with her later lee complained of a headache betty had given him a cryogenic headache pill which he took before taking a nap around 7 30 pm when lee did not come for dinner cho came to the apartment but he was unable to wake lee up a doctor was summoned and spent 10 minutes attempting to revive lee before sending him by ambulance to queen elizabeth hospital lee was declared dead on arrival at the age of 32 betty ting pei was the last person to see him while he was conscious bruce had been having health problems leading up his death in may of that year he had passed out and been rushed to hospital where he would end up being diagnosed with cerebral edema there are many rumors and different explanations of what caused his death a reaction to the equagistic ill him having eaten cannabis being killed by triad and more he suffered from a rare allergic reaction to his medication causing a swelling of brain cerebral edema some even suggest that it was actually chinese triad hit there were enemies from past runnings and there were even jealousy and anger about bruce teaching and there was even jealousy and anger about bruce teaching and asian art to non-asians and westerners something that was frowned upon in the chinese community bruce was even warned to several occasions about this we'll probably never know what actually caused his death he was buried in lake view cemetery in seattle washington his son brandon lee would be buried in the same cemetery after brandon died in tragic accident while filming the crow thanks for watching if you like the video please subscribe to my channel hit the like button below and don't forget to share this video with your friends